Today on Phoenix Down RPG, we're going to talk about Warlocks. Warlocks. Yeah, so, uh, Xenathar's Guide to Everything came out with a whole bunch of new subclasses, and uh, we're going to talk about one of my favorite classes, the Warlock. Um, really excited about this. We got two new subclasses, uh, two new patrons. Flavors. Um, and they're pretty unique. Um, I still wish there had been a little bit more bizarre thrown in here, but uh, I'm happy with what we got. Um, we'll talk about some of the weirdness of the Hexblade name, because it's confusing, but I know a lot of people have probably been like, what's that about? It sounds so cool. It does sound cool. And, and I it think, is really cool. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why they went with that name. Um, but, first, but first, let's talk about the patron attitudes towards your player. All the special flavor text that you can have designing your warlock and make them extra special. So do you want to roll for a warlock character? Yeah. This roll is, our D6. This is one of my favorite things they put in this book, are these little tables in case you just don't know why your character is the way they're, yeah, they are, you know? Because um, not all patrons will treat you kindly. No, no. Uh, except for I rolled a one, and... Uh, <laughs> in this case, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Okay. Your, your patron has guided and helped your family for generations. And it is kindly towards you. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of want to go, like, not one of these in the book and just go, like, feed and be like, I got a devil and he's on my side. He likes me. He likes me. He doesn't even understand it. He just like gives me stuff. But what's neat <laughs> is there are some options where you can trick your patron into giving you power, which creates an interesting dynamic that maybe they do not like you. Or what if you felt differently about each other? A lot of mm -hmm. fun uh, role play opportunities there. Uh, you know, some of these uh, attitudes stand out to me. Um, Number five, your patron tricked you into a pact and treats you as a slave. That's a cool character. Like, oh, I wanted power. I signed on the dotted line. I didn't realize the devil used invisible ink on me. Always look for the invisible ink. It's there. It's there. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the, the, your patron becomes this, like, omnipresent threat for your character. You have to appease them. It's, it's just good stuff. It almost kind of sounds like uh, Will Friedle's patron, although oh, he was a cleric, yeah. when his uh, his guest spot on the Critical Role uh, campaign... What, was it Vasha, I believe? I think it was Vasha. Yeah, no, I... Will Friedle, I want to know more. I want to know more. Tell us more, because it's, it's interesting that you came up with this god, and it's dark, and... Ugh good flavor make 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 a warlock version um mm -hmm. one of my other favorite attitudes on here just because i think it's interesting is your patron is the spirit of a long dead hero who sees your pact as a way for it to con continue to influence the world like that's interesting because i think most people when they think of patrons they think of like devils and fey lords and ladies mm -hmm. um something like extra powerful but what if there was this i don't know great hero that died but like they were truly epic and like their spirit persists maybe in a blade like for the hexing yeah um i don't know it's cool i like it let's move a lot on of good stuff now we're on <laughs> to the special terms of the pact maybe some of the stuff that you agreed to sign on for but you didn't realize your pact tests your willpower. You are required to abstain from alcohol and other intoxicants. No! We roll! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no. That we're could be problematic. We're reloading. No, no. What? 
Another one. Yeah. He's good at rolling yeah, ones. I, I roll a lot of ones. I like halflings. <laughs> um, when directed, you must take immediate action against a specific enemy of your patron. Which oh could boy. be part of your party. That could be bad. That could be real bad. That could be real good. Yeah. No, that, I love the possibilities there. It's good for a DM. It's potentially good for a player. Like, it gives direction, which is nice when we're talking about building a character and having a backstory. There's a couple other silly ones on here, like you can never wear the same outfit twice because <laughs> your patron finds the predictability boring. Show that bard up by looking snazzier. Yeah. Or the, if you when you cast Eldritch Blast, oh. you must speak your patron's name aloud or risk incurring their displeasure. I love this because it actually makes me think of Doctor Strange. He's all like, mm. uh, I am Agamotto and uh, Crimson Bands of Sidorak. <laughs> um, so maybe Doctor Strange isn't the Sorcerer Supreme. Maybe he just made a whole bunch of packs with a whole lot of dark gods. Maybe he's a warlock. <laughs> Summon forth the shielding powers of the Vishanti. What is this? The Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Oh, great all-seeing eye of Agamotto. You must come to my aid! <laughs> and we have one more on our flavor list, and that is the binding mark. As patrons can leave their mark on you in other ways. And maybe you try to hide it, and maybe you brandish it in joy. It's your turn to roll. What's Not six? a one! <laughs> oh, this one's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> my nose glows in the dark. Disadvantage on you're, stealth checks. <laughs> you're basically a dark Rudolph. Yeah, I'm Rudolph. Ooh, Santa Claus packed. I gotta write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Krampus packed. Krampus packed is much better. <sighs> that's 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 gonna be fun to figure out. I gotta write that up. <laughs> Ooh, that'd be a really fun one shot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Themed, holiday themed one shots are some of the best one shots because they goofy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what's some other good ones we got? One of your patron, one of your eyes looks the same as one of your patrons. You have a, I like that one. a vestigial tail in case you're not a tiefling warlock because no one's ever made a tiefling warlock before. <laughs> you display outward symptoms of a disease, but suffer no ill effects from it. I, I feel like this list could have been um, bigger and more interesting, because like some of them are not great. Like there's one where a blemish occurs on your face in different areas every day, which is a little strange. Like I have news. And what sort of news do you have? It's not bad news, is it? You know I can't take bad news. The day started out so good. Had a good night's sleep. Had a good BM. I don't want to hear any bad news. Now, what type of news is it? Well, to be perfectly frank, it's bad. Kill him! Oh, wait! You know, a mime is a terrible thing to waste. Let him go. Your Majesty, come with me and I will show you something that will make you very happy. Fetch the royal robe! Your Majesty... Stop me if I'm wrong about this, but wasn't your mole on the other side? <gasps> I have a mole? I mean, there's some really simple ones you can come up with. You know, your fingernails lengthen and look claw-like. Um, maybe... Or maybe the tips of your fingers are black. Maybe you get... Stained by your patron. Two little nubs here that kind of look like the beginning of horns. But they're not. <laughs> but you know what's missing from this list? They more than made up for with the rest of the Warlock subclasses and spells. So let's jump into our first one. The Celestial Wings. <laughs> In case you wanted to make a Warlock that is not dark, brooding, and awesome. You wanted to make someone that is beautiful and light and dazzling. And have a unicorn as your patron. Ooh, a unicorn. This is basically <laughs> like being a paladin, but warlock style. Well, I always kind of felt like the warlock in general was like the 
the magical equivalent, although different, uh, but the magical equivalent of the paladin. Uh, just in some ways, just not as spiky damage-wise, um, but certainly more uh, consistent. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Celestial is very paladin. Like it, there's a lot of paladin like features which we'll get to. Um, so the first thing right off the bat, you take the celestial pact or patron. My bad. Uh, you get an expanded spell list, and Yay. it's a great part of the warlock class. So you get these extra bonus spells that you can choose from. Uh, they are not free, like say the nope. domain spells uh, that clerics get, but. They expand your spell list choices. Mm -hmm. um, first level, you get Cure Wounds and Guiding Bolt. Pretty typical for this idea of class. I, I, I love that they added Cure Wounds to the list, but I do not expect to ever see a Warlock use one of their precious spell <laughs> slots. Considering... Precious! Slots considering how many spells they actually have to heal, especially in D, like fifth edition, where healing there are so many different ways to get healing. Um, and in most cases, it's in a player's best interest to try to take enemies off the board, thus preventing future need for healing uh, than actual healing. Um, I can just imagine Warlock heal me in the middle of battle, and the Warlock goes, Screw you, I need my spell. Unicorn power! <laughs> uh, I kind of want to make that, that uh, warlock now. I mean, I, I really like a it's lot adorable. of the features in the Celestial. There's some... We'll and get to of course it. it's more than just unicorns, but that's the most notable in my opinion. But being able to upcast Guiding Bolt as one of your spell choices is pretty awesome because not only are you hitting something really hard, but you're giving a another person in your party advantage on their next next attack, um, which is huge. Guiding bolt, big fan. Like it on the cleric list. Like it on the warlock list. Mm -hmm. uh, second spell level. Um, Flaming sphere and lesser restoration. Flaming sphere is an interesting spell that is confusing as all get out, but it is useful if you're trying to control a battlefield and it does decent damage and it's a concentration effect, so... Some more yeah. bang for your bucks with your spell list. Lesser restoration, in case you need it. I mean, it's nice that you can choose it. Um, once again, don't really expect your warlock to be casting this. Um, well, maybe not in battle, yeah, but out true. of battle, that can have a lot of uses. Yeah. Especially if your DM likes to screw with your players. And if you can actually convince your party to take a short rest, then you get your spell slot back. So yeah, uh, it could be useful. I mean, short rest, cure wounds could be useful. So, I yeah. mean, they could get used. Um, third spell level, we got... Daylight! Oh! And Revivify. Revivify. Uh, Revivify is a big one. Um, Considering you can have a short rest, Revivify, short rest, that's pretty big. I mean, the downside is, if, you know, if someone dies, you're like, I'm out of spell slots, guys, I'll take a short rest. Oh, Revivify mm -hmm. now doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> that could happen, but hopefully you have someone else in your party that can cast it, but... Hopefully you have a cleric, paladin, or druid that is saving that spell for the I battle. I could see Revivify being used in combat by the warlock as kind of a oh shit moment. Um, but yeah. Moving on to fourth level, Guardian of Faith and Wall of Fire. Two good ones. Uh, I always, I like Guardian of Faith, but you kind of have to be very battlefield conscious of where you place it because it doesn't move after you put it there and it does a set amount of damage and then goes away and then goes away but it's not a concentration effect um and depending on the battlefield and where you place it or where you if you stay near it it could be very very useful mm -hmm. wall fire well it's, it's just good to catch fire. things on fire so it's fun good <laughs> does good damage it comes a wide area um good spell um, fifth level... Flame Strike. Uh, and Greater Restoration. Cleric Nuke Spell. And Greater Restoration. Uh, 
Wolf solid. Um, Flame Strike is weird in that it's a fifth level spell and it's like almost as good as a fireball. <laughs> so, in some ways it's better, but it's a fifth level spell, so it better be better, but damage wise, equivalent. Um, I don't know. I don't see Warlocks necessarily using Flame Strike all that much. I like the expanded spell list. It makes sense thematically with the class, and I can see a lot of these spells being used. Yeah, great but illustration. But that's what's also nice is that it's an option. You don't have to have these spells. Yeah. So you can customize your warlock however you so choose. And I think by the time you get to fifth level spells, you might have more spell slots than two. You might have three at that point, in which case... More options, because that's my only complaint about Warlocks is I wish they had three spell slots for most of their starting levels and not two, but small complaint. And at first level, as the Celestial Warlock, you gain some more Light cantrips. cantrip. And Sacred Flame. And Sacred Flame. Which is not a flame. Which is not a it's flame. It's radiant damage. It's confusing. There's a couple. It is confusing. There's garbage. a couple things in fifth edition that are oddly named, like sneak, sneak attack. attack. We've uh, had a lot of discussions yeah. about that. I've sat at tables where people are like, "Can I use my sneak attack?" And the DM at that table is like, "They know you're there. You can't hide. Can't hide. It's not a sneak attack. But and that's not how it works. That's not how it works. But it's a." It's just a bad name for an ability. Um, same thing with Sacred Flame. It's just a bad name. Um, it's an well, it's okay. Sacred. I mean, it's it's a good cantrip that has a significant drawback to its use. You know um, what's great <laughs> is that it's extra spells that the warlock can cast without going into their spell reserves. Yep. And that's one of the so things. It's important. Depending on, especially if you go back to the tome, it's nice to have even more cantrips. Um, yep. And I think a lot of people like Pact of the Tome because of those cantrips and that gives you all those options. Mm -hmm. Free spells. Free spells. <laughs> and also, one of the more paladin-y things with our Celestial Warlock is that at first level you get Healing Light, which is the ability to channel Celestial Energy to heal wounds. You have a pool of D6s that you spend to fuel this healing. The number of dice in the pool equals one plus your Warlock spell. So <laughs> basically it's like the Paladin pool, but not as great because they have a D8 and you have a D6. Yeah, but this has a significant advantage over the Paladin that in that true. it's ranged. Um, yeah, within 60 feet of you... Although it doesn't... The maximum number of dice you can spend at once equals your charisma modifier. So, I mean, like, in, in the range makes it better, but you have less that you can burn at a time. And then, uh, unlike Lay on Hands, I don't think you can get rid of, like, negative effects. No. Doesn't. So, I mean, it's extra healing, um, which the Warlock will cast on themselves. Cause they well, squishy. yeah, they need it. <laughs> Uh, and it regains at a long rest. Do not skimp on your constitution bonus. Just don't. Give yourself extra hit points. <laughs> Alright, so. Starting at 6th level, you get Radiant Soul. Um, your Link to the Celestial allows you to serve as a conduit for Radiant Energy. You have resistance to Radiant Damage. You know, because that comes up. It depends on what you're fighting. And when you cast a spell that deals radiant or fire damage, you can add your charisma modifier to one radiant or fire damage roll of that spell against one of its targets. I like that part of the ability. That's cool. I mean, it's good to have resistances to things. It is. Um, and it's just... There's a couple of these character choices that they threw into Xanathar's where... They are very niche, and if you, you should have a conversation with your DM. Um, if I'm going to play, you know, a Radiant, the Celestial Warlock, are we ever going to potentially come in contact with Radiant monsters that are um, going to be against us? Or when you're high enough level, just go god hunting. 
Yeah, but it's just curious that you get this resistancy at six level. Um, cause That's where some others get resistances. Yeah, I, I, I realize that, but not a lot of things you're going to fight at six level do radiant damage. Like That's true. The, the really powerful creatures that do radiant damage, well, they're really powerful. There aren't a whole lot of low CR monsters that do radiant damage. I could be wrong. You're welcome to put it in the comments about Dylan. There's a, a goblin kobold a hybrid angel. And maybe there's more of the monsters that they've um, come up with that do do radiant, that that have radiant damage effects. So they might have compensated that for that in a different way. But it's um, a good point to bring up regardless. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's the other thing about this ability that is curious to me is that they give you uh, damage resistance to radiant, but then you can influence the damage of radiant or fire. I guess they thought giving you fire resistance was just way too powerful considering how many things do fire damage, but well, I kind of so wish they gave you the choice. Poison? Maybe maybe you get the choice between radiant or fire. Um, then everyone's going to pick fire. I don't have a problem with this. <laughs> it's just like how some classes have resistance to poison. I mean, poison is a large effect that happens in D and D. It's a very common effect, same as fire. Yeah, but not radiant. Fair enough. All right, moving on. We could we could argue about this for a while. <laughs> um, and of course, this is just our opinion. It is. On it's, the class. it's our opinion. But maybe, feel free to let us know what you think in the comments below. Maybe you guys want to run a evil campaign with a celestial Ooh. warlock. And want to go fight some angels. That would <laughs> be, like, be cool. I'm more goodly than you, but I'm fight a bad guy. Fight some Azimir. There you go. Um, fight unicorns. Don't fight unicorns. <laughs> Half-life, a cursed life. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> what was that thing you saved me from? A monstrous creature. It is a terrible crime to slay a unicorn. Drinking the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death. But at a terrible price, for you have slain something so pure that from the moment the blood touches your lips, you will have a half-life, a cursed life. But who would choose such a life? Can you think of no one? Uh, celestial Resilience. Uh, starting at 10th level, you gain temporary hit points whenever you finish a short or long rest. Those temporary hit points equal your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. Additionally, choose up to five creatures you can see at the end of your rest. Um, these creatures each gain temporary hit points equal to half your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. It's a pretty sweet uh, ability. Uh, it is. Um, More heals. It's actually a really good ability. Uh... Here's the thing, though. Once again, situationally, depending on your party makeup and what people like to do, this could become uh, not pointless. Um, maybe it would just make other abilities pointless because there are lots of things that grant temporary hit points, and temporary hit points do Don't not stack. stack. Um, what I would have preferred to see, and I, I, maybe they thought about this and thought this was too powerful, but I would love this to have raised the maximum hit points more, sort of like, mm -hmm. um, what is it, Aid, uh, the second level spell that clerics can cast, and I think Paladins can cast, to raise the maximum hit point, and then you can, you know, do your other things like Heroes Feast, or um, mm -hmm. I know Bards can grant, like, H, like, song uh, of rest. Yeah, song of rest. Or uh, there's there's a lot of abilities that grant temporary hit points. This is not a bad ability. This is a very good ability. Uh, I just see depending on your party makeup and what you guys do, this could become either the standard or just useless. 
probably not useless. You guys would probably just use this. But yeah, it's worth pointing out because um, it will not stack with your hero's feast. It's like oh. Well, if you're going into battle against a big bad and you have a lot of NPCs with you, you could use this to help boost the NPCs and use the Hero's Feast for yourself. Yeah, Hero's Feast gets a lot of people, but I guess depending on how many people you're going into like battle with, eight. yeah, and eight's a lot, but depends at your table. Just our thoughts. <laughs> Moving on to the last benefit of being a celestial warlock is searing vengeance and this is a really really powerful one it's really neat starting at 14th level the radiant energy you channel allows you to resist death when you have to make a death saving throw at the start of your turn you can instead spring back to your feet and burst in a burst of radiant energy you regain hit points equal to half your hit point maximum and then you stand up if you choose to each creature will. of your choice that is within 30 feet of you takes radiant damage equal to 2d8 plus your charisma modifier and is blinded until the end of your current of the current turn. Now once you finished it, you can't use it for after a long rest. Uh big fan. I think this is really cool. Um it's pretty unique. Uh 2d8 Plus your charisma modifier at level 14. It's still a big bang. It's going to hurt things. It's not going to kill things, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, plus, you're hitting multiples. so Yeah, each creature within 30 feet. Uh, the potential is outstanding here. Um, plus, you get hit points back. Plus, you get to stand back up. Plus, you're blinding things. There's a lot going on in this one. It's pretty good. Plus, you get... Um, what is it? Oh, it's when you make a death saving throw at the start of the turn. You so can you, choose. You don't even have to succeed the throw. You can just stand back up. So potentially, if you know you're going to go down a couple times, you could wait to use this ability. Hmm. So you can wait to die until enemies are all around you. And then just go, bam! Get I them mean, all. Yeah, I could see situationally. It's like, oh, well, maybe next turn there'll be more guys around me. And that's the Celestial Warlock. Um, they gave us two new patrons. I wish I wish they had added another pact. Um, Lots of heals. But and fuzzy unicorns. This is a pretty good patron. Uh, it fits thematically into something that is not in the game. The closest thing to this is, I guess, the Fey. Fey Paladin. Um, well, the Fey Warlock. Oh, um, there's that too. But, like, you know, you have the, the otherworldly, like, Cthulhu-esque, and then you have Pit Fiends, basically. And if you count the Skag uh, Sword Adventures Coast Guide, you have the Undying, which um, I'm surprised they didn't reprint that in here, but because they did for the Storm Sorcerer. I was curious. Interesting um, what they chose to do and what they didn't. I'm sure they had reasons. Now we're going to talk about some new invocations. Uh, I'm really excited these got in here when they released the Unearthed Arcana with a whole bunch of invocations. I was like, yes! Yes! More options! Because this is why people like playing Warlocks is because the amount of customization that is possible is basically unmatched by any other class. That's Unless you're true. talking about, you know, spell list selection, blah, blah, blah. But like, pure customization. Um, granted, yeah, you know, you can always pick the same couple ones because they are effective, but there's a lot of flavor and interesting choices that you can make. A lot of really cool stuff. Let's start at the top. Aspect of the Moon. Oh? Which sounds so much cooler than it actually is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you no longer need to sleep and can't be forced to sleep. Yeah. I mean, I, this could be useful in a campaign, you know, oh, I'm going to be the person that stays up and watches and make sure everyone's okay. But, like, uh, I don't see a lot of players picking this. Um, it's interesting that they they put a pre prerequisite on it for Pact of the Tome feature. Uh, I don't know why 
pack of the tome. I guess reading a lot of books helps you stay up and not sleep. I mean, yeah, this is true of of when I was a kid and I needed to go to bed for school the next day and mm -hmm. I'd be up at like three o'clock in the morning reading a book because you know I needed to know what happened next. Because books are awesome. Um, it's true. Read more books. Go to your libraries. Check them out. Use your e-reader. Whatever. Read more books. Well, um, and guess what? A lot of libraries have D and D material stuff. I do. I've so checked them even out. Better. It's good stuff. Next invocation: the cloak of flies. I like this one. As a bonus action, you can surround yourself with a magical aura that looks like buzzing flies. The aura extends five feet from you in every direction, but not through total cover. And it lasts until you're incapacitated or you dismiss it. The aura grants you advantage on intimidation checks, but disadvantage on all other charisma checks. Any other creature that starts its turn in the aura takes poison damage equal to your charisma modifier. And once you've used it, you can't use it again until a short or long rest. I love it. You're basically a walking AoE. Um, it's not a lot of damage, but you're hitting anything close to you. And you can scare the crap out of things. I love that they put that in there because, uh, you know, it's one of those weird things when you think about intimidating people and it's tied to charisma. Uh, they're kind of addressing that with this ability, being like, look, there's another way you can gain advantage just being, sh although as a warlock, charisma is your strong suit, but advantage um, because you look more intimidating. Yeah. This is why I'm a fan of letting, you know, your barbarians or fighters intimidate with strength instead. It's all about how you intimidate. Um, cloak of flies, I mean, it's that's scary. Cool. I'd be intimidated. I mean, yeah. You can't get it till your fifth level, though. Yeah. And I, I don't have a problem with that. Fifth level, you get a constant cloud of flies around you that hurt things. Yeah. Yeah. I just walk around with that pretty much all the time whenever I left the city. Sometimes when I'm in the city. Maybe all yeah, the time. Yeah, you can keep it with Oops. you. Oops. Sorry. Ouch. Oh, my bad. Pardon me. Oh, yep. Up next is Eldritch Smite, which is prerequisite fifth level Impact of the Blade feature. Ah, oh, fifth level. <laughs> Once per turn, when you hit a creature with your packed weapon, you can expend a warlock spell slot to deal an extra 1d8 force damage to the target, plus another 1d8 per level of the spell slot, and you can knock the target prone if it is huge or smaller. This is... First off, I love it. Um, it's desperately needed for the Pact of the Blade. Uh, I, I know a lot of people that love the idea of a Warlock with Pact of the Blade, but they grow frustrated that the Pact of the Blade is just not really, um... As optimal. As optimal as some other options. Um... Just Eldritch Blast it away. Yeah. Uh, specifically Eldritch Blast. But, you know... That's, that's a discussion for a whole other thing, but we're talking about the blade here. This is a game changer. Um, it was sorely needed for the Warlock. I don't love the fact that you have to wait to fifth level to get it. Um, it seems unnecessary to me. I guess they thought it was too strong. I guess they didn't want to throw in like a third level or second level requirement. I just think it's it's interesting that they throw in the thing about you can expend a warlock spell slot to deal an extra d8 force damage to the target and it grows more plus another d8 per level of the spell slot by fifth level your spell slot should be at third level spells so you're never going to be doing 1d8 of anything you're going to be doing 3d8 i love them i love them um they are your fighter equivalent with magic. It allows you to do a bunch of damage every round. You're not a full spellcaster, but you're using magic to do that damage. And uh, it's just, it's cool. I, I'm a big fan. Moving on. Ghostly Gaze. Uh, prerequisite, seventh level. <laughs> Even further along. Basically gives you x-ray vision. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's basically what For it gives you. Um, you know, 
there's the other one that you get in the player's handbook that gives you dark vision that allows you to see a magical darkness. I prefer that one uh, because you have to concentrate on this effect. Um, so it could be taken from you if somebody hits you. You get it back on a short or a long rest. I could see adventuring wise this could be a very useful ability especially if you're in the dungeon. It's just like oh there's a locked door here and there's a locked door here. Which one do I go through? Ghostly vision. Oh that one has a pit. That one has a treasure chest. Let's go to the treasure. Let's let's open let's spend our time on this one. Um you know I, I or could, both. What's at the bottom of the pit? Skeletons of adventurers. Which with loot. Made, with loot. With lots of loot. It's true. I mean you could then spend both your time but you'll be ready for that trap. Um yep. So I could see so, I could see someone taking it. Uh, I don't know if I would, but there's it's a use an for option it. to customize your warlock. All right, next one we go. Next one is Gift of the Depths prerequisite. Gift. I like fifth those. Level. You can breathe underwater and you gain a swimming speed up to your equal to your walking speed. Nice. You can also cast water breathing once without expending a spell slot. Nice. You regain it at the end of a long rest. Pretty sure water breathing is one of those spells you can like put on multiple people. So this could actually be a fairly signature spell, depending on the campaign. Yeah. Uh, talk to your DMs, players. Please Quite talk. Quite some cracking. Yeah. So if you guys are going to be doing a pirate themed adventure, you're going to spend a lot of time on the seas. Man, this thing will just be used constantly. And it's good to talk to your DM regardless about what you want to see in a game not necessarily that they'll throw it in but at least they will know what you prefer and another nice thing about this is this is a free spell um you don't have to expend a slot i know some of the uh invocations in the player handbook you actually have to expend your spell slot to cast this extra spell through an invocation which i don't love that design feature um yeah, so I like the free spell. Free um, spells! It's nice. So we got... Up next. The gift. Another gift. So many gifts. Oh, oh my goodness. Is it Christmas? Of the ever-living ones. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the prerequisite is the Pack to the Chain feature. Uh, it, it, this is a good one. If you're going to go back to the chain, you should probably grab this. Whenever you regain hit points while you're familiar is within 100 points of you. 100 feet. <laughs> That's what I get. <laughs> Treat any dice roll to determine the hit points you regain as having rolled their maximum value. Pretty sweet. I mean, yeah. Oh, I need to heal like, ooh, bam. Big ol' heal. Thanks, familiar. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um... You just gotta make sure your familiar doesn't die. But thankfully, if you got packed to the chain, you have a buffer familiar. So yeah, I've never had. Um, I've never made a packed to the chain warlock, but that's a pretty sweet ability. Ah, my next warlock's gonna be a blade lock, hex guy. So which will be in the next <laughs> video. Make sure to subscribe so you can see us talk about more of the Xanthar stuff. Yeah, hex blue. But for now, let's continue with the rest of the Eldritch Invocations. The Grasp of Hadar. Prerequisite, the Eldritch Blast cantrip. Okay. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with your Eldritch Blast, you can move that creature in a straight line 10 feet closer to you. Nice. So it's like the al uh, the alternative to the one in the player's handbook, um, which allows you to push people back 10 feet. Man, you could just yo-yo people with if you took both those. 10 feet back, 10 feet forward, 10 feet back, 10 feet forward. <laughs> um, I mean, this is the other cool thing about the Warlock. With Eldritch Blast, if you take one or both of these... You have really strong um, battlefield command abilities, like the druid who has a lot of spells that can affect the terrain. Um, you can really change, if, especially if you're using like uh, a grid or um, some kind of battle mat to do combat. You can really affect it. Now, if you're doing theater of the mind, well, this can be a little, a little trickier. trickier, and it may not come up as useful. 
Um, but it's still very neat. It's super neat. Uh, I love the Hadar spells uh, that warlocks get. Um, I love that theme of dark energy just like coming up from like, the negative plane, the, the shadow plane somewhere, an evil bad guy plane. Um, evil bad guy plane, I like that one. It's <laughs> just killing things. It's it's cool. Up next is the improved Pact Weapon, Desperately which needed. you should probably take if you are Pact of the Blade. Yep. You can use any weapon you summon with your Pact of the Blade feature as a spellcasting focus for your Warlock Huge. spells. In addition, the weapon gains a plus one bonus to its attack and damage rolls, unless um, it's, ma it's a magic weapon that already has a bonus to those rolls. Oh. Finally... <laughs> The weapon you conjure can be a short bow, long bow, light crossbow, or a heavy crossbow. I like that they, they specifically point that out. So you can a have lot of, a ranged weapon. I think a lot of people, when they think about Pact of the Blade, they specifically think that it should be a blade. But, um... It doesn't have to be. Yeah, that. why not play a Pact of the Blade archer? Arrows have blades sweet. on them. They're bladed. <laughs> They're bladed. <laughs> Uh, I love it because it not only does it give you the focus on your weapon, um, spellcasting focus, which is sometimes ignored uh, with spellcasters. They just don't yeah. think about it or the DM doesn't think about it because there's a zillion things going on. But it's also um, a plus one weapon. But you get a plus one weapon at fifth level, which is not bad, especially if your DM is not just handing them out like candy. Um, Especially in campaigns that are low magic, anything that grants you magic weapons like the Forge uh, Domain for the Cleric, uh, it's potentially Which game changing. see our other Cleric videos about those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ooh, man, it'd be cool to have a Celestial Warlock and a Grave uh, Cleric on the team together. You just be like, wait a second, you worship a unicorn? Wait a second, you worship the Raven Queen? What's going on here? <laughs> Talk about an interesting party dynamic. <laughs> okay. Moving on, the Lance of Lethargy. Prerequisite Eldritch Blast. Because most things, I mean, there's a lot of cantrip Eldritch Blast uh, invocations, and that's so okay. So just take Eldritch Blast. It's a good spell. I, I don't see why all the hate. It's the best cantrip. You know, people don't hate against barbarians because they hit things all the time. Yeah, you know, I have to explain that to people. It's just like, oh, what do you do on your turn? You attack. Oh, what does a warlock do on their turn? They attack. It's the same. Or like when I played a sorcerer and cast mage armor all the time. It's just <laughs> part of your class. Why, why is that such a big... Oh, I wonder what they're going to do. Cast mage armor. Yeah, they're going to cast mage armor. They don't want to get hit. They have six hit points. But the lance... Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with your Eldritch Blast, you can reduce that creature's speed by 10 feet until the end of your next turn. I like this one better than the Grasp of Hadar because, I mean, if you're blasting them away with uh, your Eldritch Blast, you took the other, uh, the other invocation. Not only are you knocking them back 10 feet, but now they're 10 feet less movement towards you. They are never going to get to you. Um, yeah, just that's pretty be, cool. You can just be like, spam, 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 spam. <laughs> no one's ever going to hit you, and you're going to be just destroying people left and right. And you're going to look like a badass doing it. Yeah! <sighs> Screw anybody else. You're just one-man wrecking crew. Yep, that's pretty cool. I love the warlock. <laughs> All right, next Eldritch Invocation. Here's a good one. Maddening Hex. Uh, this, once again, plays into the Hex Warlock, which uh, we will talk about in our next video. Make um, sure to subscribe so that you will know when it is uploaded. Good point. Plus, you'll be helping us out. Yeah. Which we like that. Yeah, we love interaction with our viewers. So, if there's something you want in Xanathar's to talk about, you want us to talk about, or Volo's Guide. Or Volo's Guide, you know. It doesn't have to be just another. Comment. Tell us what you want. We'll talk about it. All right. The Maddening Hex. Maddening Hex. Uh, prerequisite. Fifth level. Hex spell or warlock feature that curses. Uh, I love that they put that in there because it kind of even opens the door for future content that Wizards could release that might be curse adjacent. <laughs> um, as opposed to just being like it has to be um, oh, what's the, it's not Hunter's Mark what is the Hex yeah because Hex yeah um, 
Yes, the hex spell or uh, the uh, curse that the hex blade. That's the other problem with the name hex blade. Oh. <laughs> anyway, back to the invocation. As a bonus action, you cause a psychic disturbance around the target. Cursed by your hex spell or by warlock feature of yours. Such as Hexblade's Curse or Sign of Ill Omen. When you do so, you deal psychic damage to the cursed target in each creature of your choice that you can see within 5 feet of it. The psychic damage equals your charisma modifier. To use this invocation, you must be able to see the cursed target and must be within 30 feet of you. It's a nice little AoE extra bit of damage to anyone yeah. that has a hex or curse feature on them. It's not game breaking, but it's extra damage AoE. Um, I would have this on my warlock. Yeah. So, oh, yeah Definitely. This, this is a good one. What becomes the issue is at fifth level, do you take this or do you take Eldritch Smite? <laughs> That's true. Difficult choices. Uh, although, um, sometimes something people overlook, when you gain levels in Warlock, I could be wrong, but I, I'm almost positive that you can swap out your invocations. So, you could swap out invocations that you thought were going to be useful and aren't, or maybe you go Eldritch Blast until 5th level, and then you're like, screw it, I'm going straight up Blade, I'm taking both of these, I'm just going to screw people over with my sword. Plus, I like the ability to curse people. Very so. beautiful thematically. Yeah. <laughs> On to our next one, which is related, is the Relentless Hex. Prerequisite, seventh level, hex spell, or a warlock feature that curses. Your curse creates a temporary bond between you and your target. As a bonus action, you can magically teleport up to 30 feet Ooh. to an unoccupied teleport. space. You can see within five feet of your target, cursed by your hex spell or by a warlock feature of yours, such as hex blades, curse, or sign of ill omen. To teleport in this way, you must be able to see the cursed target. So once again, if you have Devil Sight, that's pretty useful because you will be able to see them. Mm. For all those people always playing Variant Humans. Stop playing Variant Humans. Or pick the appropriate invocation. <laughs> all right. I mean, uh, we're humans in real life. Yeah. Have fun being something else. Yeah. Halflings anyway. rock. That lucky... I love tieflings. Yeah. Oh, yeah, everyone likes tieflings. They look That's cool. not true. Well, people in game worlds generally don't, but people at game, game tables do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, Relentless Hex, it gives you a teleport. People can't get away from you. It's it's nice. You don't have to Pretty expend awesome. spell slots. Um, you can just hunt down these people. It's it's nice. I could see a lot of people want that killing blow hunter. or bounty hunter concept. So, like, this, this really goes with that. So, it's good. I think it at some level. Exquisite 15th level. That's a lot of levels. Yeah, no. Man, I would abuse this so bad. I understand why they put a 15th level on this because this is so Powerful. good. Powerful. You can cast invisibility at will without spending a spell slot. That's amazing. Uh, no one would see me ever. Uh, you can attest. Stay invisible. You can attest to this with my uh, six level warlock. Uh, I was given, or I took off of a halfling, uh, a ring of invisibility. Um, that he now just wears permanently. Pretty much, I am. I'm invisible as much as I can be uh, because it's such a powerful effect, and it allows me to do things and trick people. And or he just changes his face into somebody else because he has yeah. that. 
Yeah. Invocation as well. I like the being able to alter self at will without spending a spell slot as well. Uh, there's so many options within the invocations. So that's pretty beautiful. Because uh, my warlock is a charlatan. He likes to mess with people. <laughs> but, you know, Shroud of Shadow, 15th level, it's appropriate. It's a super powerful ability. Uh, I mean, granted, you're going to be able to get invisibility before 15th level through other sources. But this doesn't take your spell slots. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a attunement slot. You don't need a wizard uh, also, granting you spells. You can cast <laughs> it on other people. Oh. Huh. It doesn't say on yourself at will. It says you can cast it at will. That's true. I didn't consider that. Um, a character granting another person a boon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The Tomb of Levistus. Prerequisite is the fifth level. As a reaction, when you take damage, you can entomb yourself in ice, which melts away at the end of your turn. You gain 10 temporary hit points per warlock level, which take as much of the triggering damage as possible. Immediately after you take the damage, you gain vulnerability to fire damage, your speed is reduced to zero, and you are incapacitated. These effects include any remaining temporary hit points all end which when the ice melts. Once you use this invocation, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Double-edged sword here. Um, yeah. Prerequisite fifth level, so that's not too bad. Healing, but... Well, it's not really healing. It's basically, temporary. if you know that bad dude is about to unleash Armageddon on your party and you guys can't get away... Well, maybe you throw up a, a block of ice, protect yourself, and worry about your next action after that horrific attack has occurred. And hopefully it's not fire damage. Well, you only get vulnerability to fire damage after the temporary hit points are gone? Yeah, immediately after you take the damage, then you gain vulnerability to fire. Yeah, so, I mean, I could see uh, a situation where... Because you get 10 hit temporary hit points per warlock level, so if you're... At that point, it's 50. Level 15, fighting a red dragon, you're getting 150 temporary hit points. That dragon unleashes its breath weapon attack. It's probably not going to do 150 points of damage, but, but it's probably going to... It's going to do a lot, and you will be protected. So I could see... I could see this being very useful strategically. It, it also kind of... Uh, I'm sure there are quite a few World of Warcraft players out there. Uh, the mage... Like used yeah, to be. The mage had a similar ability in that game where it's just like, oh, I'm just... You can't hurt me. For like however many seconds you just can't... You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Um, so I could see cool. maybe they took inspiration from other sources and was like, this is cool. Let's throw it in our game. Um, and I mean... Although the Warlock couldn't do this in World of Warcraft, um, but still, cool. But this is D&D. This is D&D, and things are a little bit different. Um, Alright, so our last invocation. Trickster's Escape. Seventh level prerequisite. And, I mean, it's, it's a free spell slot, so you can cast Freedom of Movement once on yourself without expending a spell slot. You gain it back when you finish a long rest. I mean, it's still pretty cool. Uh, I mean, freedom Not of movement. You can't be restrained. You can't be... You're just going to get away so people can't grapple you. Um, can't touch this. I, I, Trishka's escape. It makes sense if you're playing a character that's going to be getting into problems where people are going to be trying to stop them from getting away. It could absolutely be useful. I, I don't see a lot of people necessarily taking it, but depending on your concept... It absolutely fits. Um, and that's what I love about the Warlock is if you have a concept, chances are within all of these features you can get something unique uh, that feels distinct from all the really other classes cool. and it's thematically just badass because uh, Warlocks are badass. Because that's what you want to be when you play d and I mean, it's true. You want to be badass. You don't want to be the, I'm the regular guy in the party. Hi, guys. You look heroic. I'm Bob. You look uh, super smart. And, um, wow, that's a, an amazingly huge axe you're carrying there, sir. I am um, Arthur Sir Pennyworth, and um, 
I read books at night when you guys go to bed. That'd be great. <laughs> well, I mean, if you take Aspect of the Moon, that's what you're doing, so. <laughs> be a badass. Good rule for life. Yeah. Anyway, this has been our review of the Celestial Domain for Warlocks and the Eldritch Invocations. Invocations! Be sure to like and subscribe for the next Xanathar's Guides videos that are coming up. But I can tell you the next one is going to be about the Hexblade. And... And the spells. Yeah, we're going to talk about the new Warlock spells. Uh, because There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. We're not going to get all of them. But, but they're so cool. They're so cool. Uh, I'm so glad that they put these in because they were desperately needed. And oh, yeah, there's some good ones. So check us out. Phoenix Down RPG. I'm a teal. Let's do this. Do it. Be a badass. Put your hand up. Oh, ah. Be a badass. <laughs>